Welcome to sections 12.8 and 12.9. All right, gentle people, in the last lecture, we talked about the Schrodinger equation. And what I told you guys is this equation represents a wave. Now, that wave is how we're representing the electron. Now, the Schrodinger equation, for it to work, we have to set certain numbers in the Schrodinger equation to certain values. That's what we call solving the Schrodinger equation. Once we solve the Schrodinger equation, what we get out is the probable location of the electron and its energy. So I wanna go ahead and talk about an analogy. Let's say that I have an equation x plus y equals seven. Now I tell you guys that I'm gonna put certain restrictions on x. Let's say that x has to be a whole number and it has to be a positive value. Y has to be positive as well, and it can be whole numbers. Now, what you guys will see here is that I can solve this equation, and there are certain sets of numbers that will work for this equation. If X is a certain number, Y has to be a certain number, but the long and the short is that this is a solvable equation, and what you guys will note is someone else can solve this equation for you and tell you what X and Y can be. Now that's the same thing with the Schrodinger equation. People have already solved the Schrodinger equation for a variety of conditions, and these solutions, well, they're going to tell you characteristics about the wave or the electron itself. Now the solutions to the Schrodinger equation that people have already solved for you are called the quantum numbers. They are the numbers that will make the Schrodinger equation true. Now you guys in PCHEM, or if you have upper division physics classes, will work with it and you will see how you can solve these equations. However, I'm just gonna give you the solutions and I'm gonna tell you what are the restrictions on these quantum numbers and what these quantum numbers tell you. So let's talk about the first quantum number. The first quantum number is called the principal quantum number. It's abbreviated by an N. Now the restriction on N is it can be one, two, three, and so on. It has to be whole positive numbers that are not zero. Now N, what it does is it tells you the energy of the electron. It tells you how far the electron can be from the nucleus. Oftentimes, it is called the electronic shell. So if you guys go ahead and look at this picture here, this kind of tells you what n is doing. So I have n equals one, n equals two, and n equals three. Now what this graph is telling you is this is the distance away from the nucleus in picometers, and then on the y-axis, is the probability to find that electron. So what you will see is n equals one, this is the most probable location to find the electron. Now it does have probability outside that peak, but it's just much lower. What you will see as I increase n, so if I go to n equals two, an electron having this principal quantum number, it is more probable to find that electron further away than n equals one. And this is gonna hold true for n equals three. An electron with this principal quantum number is, is gonna be probably located further away than n equals one and then n equals two. Now, for both of these, n equals two and n equals three, there is some probability to find the electron a little bit closer. So the next quantum number I wanna talk about is called the angular momentum or the azimuthal quantum number. It's abbreviated by italicized L and it can be integer values. However, there is one restriction on which integer values it can be. The L is going to be based on the N in the Schrodinger equation. So again, both of these are gonna be plugged into an equation and L is gonna be dependent on the principal quantum number. The only possible values that will work in the Schrodinger equation of L is it could be N minus one, N minus two, N minus three, dot, 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 
all the way to zero. Now, sometimes instead of using the numerical value of L, L is sometimes described using letter abbreviations. For example, if L equals zero, we call that an S orbital. If L equals one, we call that a P orbital, L equals two, D orbital, L equals three, and F orbital. This quantum number is sometimes referred to as the subshell. Now, before I get into telling you what L is telling you about the electron, let's talk about one more quantum number, the magnetic quantum number. The magnetic quantum number is abbreviated with an M sub L. So like L, M sub L has some restriction. It can be a whole number, but it can be negative, zero, or positive. The restrictions for M sub L is it can have values of minus L, minus L plus one, minus L plus two, dot, 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 all the way to zero, dot, 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 plus one, plus two, dot, 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 all the way to positive L. Now I'll give you a chart showing you these restrictions and how some of these works, but let's go ahead and tell you what these last two quantum numbers are going to tell you about the electron. So L is going to tell you the shape. So for example, if I have an L equal to zero, that means what I have is an S orbital. The shape of an S orbital is a perfect sphere. So if I wanted to find the probable location of an electron, well, it's perfectly symmetrical around the nucleus if it has this quantum number. Now, if L is zero, the only possible value of M sub L is going to be zero. So M sub L doesn't really tell you too much for an S orbital. But let's take a look at another L value. Let's say I have the L value of one. An L value of one corresponds to something called a P orbital. A P orbital is in the shape of a dumbbell. And what it is saying is that the most probable location for an electron are in these lobes of the dumbbell. So if my nucleus is in the center, what I'm saying is the most probable location to find the electron is above the nucleus and below the nucleus. Now, if L equals one, the possible M sub L values are from negative L to L using whole number steps. And so if that's the case, my M sub L values are negative one, zero, and one. So there are three possible M sub L values. Now M sub L tells you the orientation of your orbital. So for example, I have a dumbbell shape for a P orbital. Now this dumbbell can be orientated in space in three different ways. If I look at this Cartesian coordinate graph, what I can see is I can have my dumbbell going up and down along the Z axis. This is called the PZ orbital. An alternate way to orient my dumbbell is to go in and out along the X axis. This is called a PX orbital. I can also orientate my dumbbell from left to right. This is called a PY orbital. Now what you will see is each one of these are gonna have an M sub L value. So for example, I can assign PZ as the M sub L value of negative one. This can be zero, and this one can have a value of one. Now I should warn you, these values are arbitrary, so I can just switch them around what you should note is that a different M sub L value means a different orientation. My orbital is lying in space in a different way. One other thing that you should note is that the shading of these orbitals are slightly different. Now, sometimes what you guys will see is you'll see a P orbital with a plus sign and a minus sign. Now these plus signs and minus signs don't represent charge. 
Remember, these are electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. However, what we're envisioning is our electron is a wave. And a wave goes up and down. It has positive values and negative values. So what you're seeing here with this positive and negative is that the wave has a positive value and the wave has a negative value when I put a negative on these lobes. Now you'll notice that a p orbital has something called a nodal plane. And so that's kind of this plane that I've put in the p orbital. The nodal plane means that there is no probability to find an electron there. So what you see here is that I can find the electron here and here, but there is no chance to find the electron where this plane resides. If I have L equals two, this is called a D orbital. Now there's two shapes in a D orbital. So if I wanna look at this D orbital here, this is designated as DZX. So what you guys will see is I can look at my ZX plane. And what you guys will see is that I have two dumbbells crisscrossing or a clover shape. Now this represents my D orbital. What you guys will see is four of them have this kind of shape. The DX squared minus Y squared, the DZX, the DYZ, and the DXY. Now, these subscripts on here tell you the plane in which the clover is orientated in. So for example, the DZX, well, the clover is in the ZX plane. For the DXY, what I would do is I would look at the XY plane in my Cartesian coordinate graph, and I would see the lobes of the clover in between the axes. Now the dx squared minus y squared, what you will notice is it is also in the xy plane. However, it has its lobes on the axis lines itself. Now the other shape that you can have is you can have something called the dz squared. Now for the dz squared, we can look at the z axis. It has a dumbbell and around this dumbbell is a donut or a toroid. So again, wherever you see these lobes, this is where you guys expect to find electrons. These are the most probable locations for an electron having this quantum number. Now, if L equals two, what you guys will notice, I can go from minus L, so minus two, I can step by whole numbers, and I can make those steps go to positive L or two. So for a D orbital, there are five versions. Minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two for my M sub L values. What you guys will see is I've drawn out the five versions or the five orientations of those d orbitals. Now what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to memorize the shape and orientation of these orbitals for s, p, and d. You are not expected to know the shapes of the f orbitals, but just in case you guys are curious, these are the shapes of the f orbital. If you have an l equal to 3, your m sub l is going to go from minus l, so minus three, take steps by one all the way to positive l, or positive three in this case. So there are seven versions of the f orbital. So what does all of this mean? So what I'm trying to impart on you guys is that the electron is being treated as a wave. Now, there's only certain waves that can exist inside an atom. The waves that exist inside the atom are described by the Schrodinger equation. You solve the Schrodinger equation and only certain solutions work. Those solutions are called the quantum numbers, where the n 
tells you how far the electron is, and L and M sub L tell you the shape and orientation of that, of that electron. If you combine these two, what we get out are something called orbitals. Orbitals are the representation of the existing wave that represents the electron. So when I combine these two things, what I get are the probable locations of where the electron is going to reside and the energy of that particular electron. So that's what the orbitals are telling you. They are telling you they are telling you where the properties of the electron are going to manifest. Now, if you look at 12.3, what you guys can see is some iterations of possible orbitals or possible ways the electron can reside inside an atom. For example, if I have n equals to 1, well, my only L value that's possible is 0. If my only value of L is zero, M sub L is going to be zero, and there's only one way or one orbital in which the electron can manifest itself. If I go further out, my electron has more energy, so that could correspond to N equals two. If N equals two, my possible L values are zero and one. If my L value is zero, then my M sub L value has to be zero. So again, that there's only one way for this electron to manifest it. However, if my L value is one, then my M sub L value could be negative one, zero, and plus one. So there are three different orbitals or three different ways that electron can exist and I can work my way down the chart, increasing the value of n and seeing the consequence or the ways in which I can manifest L and M sub L giving me orbital. So just some mathematics out of this. If you have a principal quantum number of n, well, you're gonna have n subshells. Or what this really means is if you have n, you will have n ways to represent the L value. If you have the L, there is two L plus one ways to go ahead and have M sub L. The total number of orbitals in a given shell is gonna be N squared. Now that we've set the stage of orbitals and how the electron is going to manifest itself, we can go ahead and describe these electrons. So let's go ahead and take a look at this in the next lecture. I hope that made sense, Kim 1A, and remember to stay safe.